I'm here to introduce the Paul R. Pintrich Award. Um, the Paul R. Pintrich Outstanding Dissertation Award recognizes excellence in doctoral dissertation research that is completed within the past two years. Um, each of the past two years, uh, Heather and I have had uh, numerous high quality applications. And on behalf of my co-chair, Heather, who will speak in a minute, I wanna thank the committee members of, of the award committee who have given selflessly their time to review and evaluate these dissertations. The committee for this year consisted of Mary McCaslin, Chris Walters, Jamal Matthews, Martin Jones, and Allison Cuenca. Next, I wanna turn it over to my co-chair, Heather Haverback, to introduce the winner of last year's award. Good afternoon or good morning. I am here to introduce Dr. Kevin Wong, who is an assistant professor at Pepperdine University in the Graduate School of, Educational, of Education and Psychology. He received his PhD in teaching and learning at New York University and specialize, specializes in literacy and multilingual education. He's receiving this award for the dissertation entitled The Promise of Educational Media for Dual Language Learners L1 and L2 Vocabulary Development under the advisement of Dr. Susan Newman. So welcome, Kevin. Congratulations, too. Thank you so much, Heather and Dan, and also for the entire dissertation award um, committee for all your tireless reviews, especially during um, this challenging year. Um, I'm very grateful and definitely want to acknowledge that. Um, so I would love to share a little bit about my dissertation with you. Um, and uh, the title is, the, as Heather had mentioned, The Promise of Educational Media for Dual Language Learners, um, uh, L1 and L2 Vocabulary Development. Um, today, I'll be going through um, some background uh, and the motivations for this research. Then I'll talk a bit about this three-part dissertation that I uh, completed. And then I'll go with a deeper dive into the third study um, as I'd like to share a little bit more about the methods and findings and implications with you. So first, the background and motivations. So first of all, um, I began as an elementary school teacher. Uh, I was a teacher in a public school um, for six years uh, where I taught English learners um, um, uh, who were pre predominantly Chinese speakers, as you can see in one of their uh, photos there. While teaching, um, I was really interested in infusing different pedagogies um, to support uh, my learners. And so media was one of those um, ways that I was interested in, in supporting them. And, and when supporting them, I was thinking about their multilingual development. So always interested in how to support their new language learning. So their second language or L2, um, and then also their heritage language maintenance. So supporting the preservation of um, here in this case, Chinese in the North American context context. Um, moving to research then, I became really interested in um, the younger children and working with dual language learners. Now, dual language learners are often the, the early childhood population of students uh, or of children. They're not quite students yet because they're preschool. Um, and they're called dual language learners because they are simultaneously developing that first language while also very much acquiring the second language uh, at the same time, and so hence the dual language nature of it. Now, when working with dual language learners, I'd been interested in interventions that could promote uh, bi or multilingual development in them, and then drawing from my background as a teacher, um, thinking about media as a potential tool to support um, language de development among dual language learners. And lastly, um, you know, going back to the title of this dissertation, vocabulary was something I had been very interested in as an English teacher um, of uh, elementary school students. And um, vocabulary is foundational for literacy development, as many of you uh, may know. Um, longitudinal studies demonstrate uh, or predict the reading and uh, literacy uh, um, outcomes of children in middle school um, as well as beyond um, in some cases. And studies have also been looking at first and second language. So those are some reasons there. Now going into a bit of the background, uh, why media usage then? Well, media usage among young children, unsurprisingly, and perhaps um, compoundedly now during COVID, um, children are on screen more than ever before, two or more hours per day, um, despite you know, American Pediatric Academy recommendations for um, less than that. Um, educational media then has been something that people, scholars and um, have been interested in studying. So you know, while the quantity of media will continue to increase, it's honestly not gonna be going down, 
how can we increase the quality of media? And so from the early 80s, when we were studying Sesame Street until now with Blue's Clues and Dora the Explorer and Niha Kailan and other ones as well, um, studies and scholars have found that educational media can support both school readiness as well as vocabulary. And then most recently with that third bullet point, how media can also be helpful for L2 vocabulary learning um, with early childhood populations. So when we think about multimedia environments, how is it that they can be environments or platforms that support bilingual vocabulary? Well, first, repeated exposure. So I'm not sure if any of you, like me, have a two-year-old, but children really uh, will they have the capacity to watch the same program over and over again or to, to watch certain clips over and over again. And so with that repeated exposure, children are getting multiple um, sources of input of uh, content and hear vocabulary in different media, uh, in, uh, in different languages. Secondly, multimedia uh, in and of itself provides rich visual representations that are co uh, in combination with sound to that can support vocabulary learning as per um, Pybio's dual coding theory. And so um, th those are some potential um, uh, considerations for why multimedia environments might support bilingual vocabulary. And then lastly, before diving into the study, a bit more background is, you know, when I was thinking about this dissertation, this research, I was thinking, so when I was an instructor and a teacher, what are some of those instructional supports that I used in the classroom that also could be seen um, on screen? And so I was thinking, and this is what I would tell my friends, because, you know, it would be like, what is Elmo doing? So I would say, you know, what is Elmo doing on screen? How is he providing repetitions to support um, that vocabulary development? Is he repeating the words? How many times? How frequently? What kind of words? Secondly, does Elmo provide visual supports? Is he, um, you know, having the image that, that he's talking about appear? And is there some sort of yeah, visual representation that can help um, commit that uh, image and vocabulary word to children's memory or understanding? Third, does Elmo, and apologies for saying Elmo, this is how I've talked about it with my friends, but do characters provide clear and explicit definitions of the words to, to the viewers? Are, are they talking about it? Are they talking, are they naming it, talking about it, defining it, giving examples? Um, fourthly, uh, a little bit more recent, thinking about with dual language learners, how can uh, Elmo or our characters strategically use the L1 to support um, bilingual development of vocabulary? Um, are they providing translations at a certain opportune time to, to really scaffold that learning? And lastly, thinking about overall the language of instruction. What, lang what language are you using to instruct or, pro or provide input to children um, through screens? Uh, and how does that influence bilingual development? And so in order to understand that, I, con I designed a three-part dissertation. And overall, the, the dissertation was um, created to examine the specific mechanisms on screen that might facilitate both first and second like, vocabulary acquisition for dual language learners. And then in addition to understanding those different mechanisms, and there are three, as this is a three-part dissertation, um, I was also you know, aware that children come to screens, come to schools, come to learning environments uh, with very different language uh, sk proficiency skills in the L2. And so I wanted to know if there, how the moderating role of the second language proficiency on learning from screens. And so three screen-based mechanisms, and I did little gears because, you know, they kind of seem like mechanisms um, in that way. Uh, so first, screen-based pedagogical supports. So um, looking at, um, you know, so kind of like that research that I had just shown of what we see on uh, in classrooms. Are there explicit definitions? Are there repetitions? Are there visual effects or sound effects? And so those were two, four different conditions that I had in this first um, in this first uh, um, study. Secondly, is the instructional context. So this was stepping back a little bit more and looking at the context or genre in which vocabulary was presented to children. Was it, for example, expository? So think of Sesame Street and how there are words that fly around and images that appear and they kind of talk about the word. Is it participatory where you see Dora the Explorer saying backpack, say backpack, and then my child and others possibly actually talk to the screen, right? And they participate or perhaps a more narrative approach. So that would be um, where the vocabulary word is embedded within the conversation between uh, characters as they're talking. So it's a bit more incidental in nature. 
And then the third mechanism that I was interested in studying was language of instruction. So how does the language of the overall program and also the language of the definitions that are provided to children, uh, how does that influence um, bilingual vocabulary development? And I will go into detail with that third study uh, in a little bit. But just from uh, some main findings from these first two and then moving to the third, with screen-based pedagogical supports, and those are the four conditions on the left, there was a main effect for screen-based pedagogical supports. So um, these supports were differentially able to um, support uh, English learning in the media context. There was also an interaction with um, L2 exposure. So as children, uh, I, I, uh, with children with lower proficiency in L2 and then higher proficiency L2, um, there was an interaction. So they were further um, facilitative. We could see further differences between those conditions. Um, and most interesting perhaps was that, rep that, that repetition pedagogical support. So repeating that vocabulary word in this study um, was particularly effective for children with less L2 exposure in that subgroup. And so that has really an interesting implications, which I'll discuss in a little bit. For this second study, we're looking at the instructional context. There's the expository, participatory, and narrative. So there was, again, a main effect for instructional context. So they were differentially facilitative in supporting um, English learning in this study. The participatory, so Dora the Explorer talking to the kid, as well as the expository, so thinking of um, Sesame Street and having all those um, supports, did significantly uh, they were significantly more effective than the narrative in supporting bilingual development. And again, there was an interaction with the English vocabulary measure that I had used, a standardized measure called the Peabody Picture Vocabulary Test. Um, moreover, um, when, think, when uh, looking at that interaction, the expository context was particularly helpful for the higher uh, proficiency group in English the vocabulary. And so really important implications there. And so with my remaining time, I'm going to go a little bit more in detail with this third study that uh, looks at language learning on screen and it considers the role of language of instruction for dual language learners. Um, the rationale behind it is um, thinking about language of instruction. So what language are we using to present content and, and provide input to children? Um, it's a form of asset-based pedagogies as we've seen the field uh, consider the languages that children are speaking at home and making school or learning environments like media more relevant um, or aligned to those uh, assets that children are bringing to screens or to learning environments. Also research is, you know, suggesting that, um, you know, how we can strategically use a child's L1 to support that second language development. While that statement has been, uh, has been made in a number of studies, we're still trying to understand exactly what that strategic use is of the L1. And so I was thinking that in line with this third bullet point and thinking about explicit definitions, what if some explicit definitions um, were used in that L1 to support um, second language development? And so overall, the aim of this study was to examine the potential of providing explicit definitions of second uh, length of L2 words using a child's L1. So the research questions, first and second, um, how does the language of instruction? And then secondly, how does the language of definitional supports affect bilingual vocabulary learning in dual language learners? So two of those pieces there. I wanted to start just by showing the four conditions because then it kind of helps uh, you perhaps helps wrap your mind around how this was designed. And so there are four different conditions. On the top row is the language of instruction and the middle row is language of definitions. It's the same uh, television program. I chose uh, Nihao Kailan, uh, who teaches Mandarin to children. Uh, thank you, uh, Doug, for that comment. Uh, L1 means first language and L2 means second language. So in this context, I was working with Chinese uh, her, uh, Chinese children, ethnically Chinese children, um, some who spoke English and uh, some who spoke Chinese, uh, depending on their home backgrounds. And so with this first condition, there was a video clip of Nihao Kailan and she is, uh, the, the video clip is in English. And then when you come across the vocabulary word pinwheel, the language of definition is also in English. So an example is a pinwheel is a toy that turns in the wind. Second condition, we have the program is still in English, but then when she comes to the word pinwheel, she says a pinwheel, and then the language of definition comes in. So like really mixing in the, the, um, the Chinese as a, a strategic support of supporting language development. Uh, 
The third condition, Chinese program with a Chinese definition. And then this fourth one might be interesting for those of you who are more English dominant, where it's a Chinese program and the whole thing's in Chinese. And then suddenly you hear the words feng chi, which is the underlined word in the bottom right. And suddenly she changes to zi feng chi is a toy that turns in the wind. So uh, we might be able to apply that definition because it's in our heritage language. So there are four different conditions and um, I can explain a bit more in a little bit. The sample of children that I had, um, that I worked with participants, there were 87 of them, half male, female, um, about five years old in age, 91% were ethnically Chinese. The other 9% were um, of mixed heritage, like myself. Um, we had uh, English PPVT and Chinese PPVT. Those are those standardized uh, uh, picture, uh, Peabody picture vocabulary tests, um, which would use, which I used as a baseline as well as covariates. In the, in the analysis later. I also tried to understand their language environment to understand um, uh, English and Chinese um, uh, yeah, environment at home. So uh, what kind of books are they reading? What kind of uh, languages are spoken at home and so on and so forth. Now for the research design, I used a within subjects design. These are often uh, used in media studies, especially with young children, considering um, how children come to screens with very different ways of uh, providing attention to screens of different background knowledge and whatnot. So within subjects design compares the child to themselves. They're exposed to all conditions and serve as their own control um, and uh, helps with threats to internal validity and other aspects that I'm happy to talk about later if helpful. Um, there were four two minute video programs um, that taught novel words, four versions of each video by language condition. Now you see why I showed that um, diagram before. So there were four different programs and four different conditions, so 16 in total. Participants viewed all four videos in a counterbalanced fashion, so they only watched one of each of those four conditions. These programs provided six novel English words as well as six novel Chinese words that were comparable in difficulty, and I'm happy to talk about that. Uh, in, the future, in the future as well. In terms of procedure, I first did a screening measure. If children were aware or could produce any of the English or Chinese vocabulary words, they were given a sticker, but screened out of the study um, because we wanted to make sure, or I wanted to make sure that children were learning from the videos themselves. And then the English and Chinese PPVT for those baseline vocabulary measures. Children then watched the four videos in counterbalance fashion according to a Latin square design, and then they completed vocabulary post tests, which I'll explain on the next slide. Importantly, my assessors were wonderful and very helpful English Mandarin bilingual speakers, uh, early childhood education majors. I'm very grateful for their help. Um, and the assessment followed the language of instruction. So if the program was in Chinese, then we assessed their Chinese vocabulary. If the program was in English, we assessed their English. However, considering children came some more English dominant and some more Chinese dominant, the assessors reacted to the children's language choices, which is the study in and, all of, in and of itself. But if the children were more English dominant, we would conduct it more in English, but still test those Chinese words and vice versa. So, now to understand the um, vocabulary measures, um, I have a ladder on the right, and that is to indicate the incremental nature of vocabulary vocabulary learning and vocabulary knowledge, particularly uh, with young children. Um, and so here we see if children can label a vocabulary word um, versus the bottom two, which are about word meaning, arguably uh, demonstrating a deeper understanding of the word. Also receptive versus expressive. If you can point to the pinwheel um, versus if you could tell me what this is, is this, and they would say a pinwheel. So different degrees of this, um, of understanding uh, vocabulary. Um, and strategically se sequenced so we wouldn't give away any answers before you know, asking. The analysis was a two by two repeated measures and COVA uh, with language of instruction um, and language of definitions as within subjects factors. For the other two dissertation studies, you know, those were where some different conditions came in, but there is a similar analysis. Um, covariates included the age uh, of children in months, considering uh, developmental considerations, uh, and then also standardized English and Chinese PPVT scores. Um, just in, as a snapshot, um, what I found was that there was a main effect for the language of instruction with all three vocabulary measures. And so that suggests that when the programs reflect the dominant language of the, ch of the child or the person viewing, um, it does support that vocabulary development. 
in two languages too, in Chinese and English here. There were, however, no effects for language of definition uh, with each measure. So swapping out the definition as that strategic use of the L1 was not as, um, was not significant here. Just kind of seeing it one other way, and then I'll be wrapping up soon, is in this first row, um, the blue, that's what was significant, right? So when the program was uh, reflecting that dominant language, that middle row was not where the language of definition that we swapped um, was, or I, was not uh, significant. And so in conclusion, the language of instruction is imperative with dual language learners. Children are drawing from their linguistic repertoire, they're drawing from their language background to make meaning of new content on screen and, and other learning environments too. So this is aligned with a lot of the research in asset-based pedagogies. Um, Speaking of which, so language of instruction is a way to honor and uh, see and hear the children's uh, uh, backgrounds and, and to bring them to that learning environment to make it more meaningful and um, powerful. Um, and it kind of uh, goes against this immersive type of model, which we also call the sink or swim model, where if the entire program is in Chinese and you speak English, then you're going to either sink or swim if you can make it or, or not. So um, that, that is uh, an important thing. And then lastly is the language of definitions. So although, you know, I'm, we're always disappointed when we don't get significance, but a null finding is also very helpful. So, um, Although the language of definitions was not was not significant, I do believe you know it's perhaps additive, and I would love to continue to see if bringing changing that language of definition and perhaps having uh, a, an attention directing cue in the first language would that collectively support vocabulary learning. And so lastly, with some broader implications of the overarching dissertation, and I'm happy to talk more about it later or to share uh, with anybody uh, in future days, um, is that certain pedagogical supports are more effective than others on screen. So there are, so uh, we need to be mindful of what we're putting on screens, how we're scaffolding our content uh, for vocabulary learning in two languages to students. So for example, in the first study, repetition was uh, a support that accelerated the second language vocabulary of children who were less proficient in English, which has huge implications for um, either narrowing a gap or, or getting them very ready for kindergarten when they enter schools. Secondly, language proficiency matters. Unlike a lot of policy statements or documents that you know, categorize English learners and English language learners in one bucket, um, dual language learners are a very heterogeneous group. And we saw that with so many different interactions and moderating effects in these um, studies. Uh, for example, in the second study, um, a Matthew effect uh, perhaps was in place where when children who were in the higher proficiency group were exposed to that expository context of the Sesame Street, they learned more than uh, those in the, um, the lower proficiency group who kind of leveled out. And so we kind of see a Matthew effect where those that have continue to have more um, so, and yeah, something to continue to consider, consider. And then lastly, and I think perhaps most encouraging for myself with my background and what I'm interested in is that language heritage, uh, heritage language maintenance is possible through media scaffolds. Um, as schools continue to be English dominant and hopefully become more bilingual, I'm, I'm sending my kid to a bilingual preschool. Um, um, there is the potential of media to support and preserve that heritage language and culture. Um, and I think that's a very encouraging thing considering um, our incredibly diverse um, population. And the New York Times just came out with a very interesting statistic based on the consensus as well. I would like to acknowledge those that supported me along this journey. Those of you know, it takes a village to, to get through a dissertation. So my advisor, Susan Newman, Preeti Samudra, the LTC lab, Head Start Centers, as well as the Chinese American Planning Council and those that support funded, so IES, Television Academy, and the Turf uh, Foundation were helpful. And again, thank you so much for um, this, uh, the Educational Psychology Division for this honor of the Paul R. Pintrich Award. He was an outstanding scholar, so I'm grateful to be in his footsteps. Mm -hmm.